And if you don't believe the King James Bible is perfect, and if you have heard that there's errors in the King James Bible, I guarantee you it's coming from a man's opinion. I want you to put aside the opinions of a man today, and I just want you to look at the facts that are presented to you. This is the most read, most memorized, most preached book in the history of the world. All of this happening in that one canon of scripture, you really need to ask yourself, was God taken by surprise by all of this? Or did he orchestrate it? If I do not the works of my Father, believe me not. But if I do, though ye believe not me, believe the works, that ye may know and believe that the Father is in me, and I in him. All right, here we go. I'm just going to go through this pretty much as quick as I can, just to kind of show you one after the next patterns and anomalies and things that just shouldn't happen in one book. So Jesus Christ in Revelation 22, 13 says, I'm Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last. And remember in the Bible, he, it says that he is the word made flesh. So Jesus Christ is the word. He is the Alpha and the Omega, which are the first and the last letters of the alphabet in Greek. Now, I believe that God has had this Bible in mind since the very beginning, since the first scriptures were being penned. He knew it wasn't going to stay in those original languages. And God obviously didn't care about keeping it in one language because he didn't use Hebrew for the New Testament. The Old Testament was written, so the Old Testament represented here, was written in Hebrew. And then the New Testament over here is written in Greek. However, God, God is omniscient. He knows the end from the beginning. He knew all the Greek words and all the Hebrew words would eventually be translated into one language, one book that holds all those words together. Now, obviously, the Bible has been translated into thousands of languages. So what is so special about this version of the Bible? All around the planet Earth, the language of English is spoken commercially. And I mean, just it's on people's T-shirts, it's on stores. Just drop, just go to Google Earth, take the little yellow guy with the Google Street View, and just drop him anywhere on planet Earth, and you're going to find English very fast. Imagine this wasn't the most influential and printed book in the world. Imagine just finding any book that does what I'm about to show you. All right. So, the New Testament. If you count all the words of the Bible, the New Testament, of course, is where Jesus Christ his ministry and the epistles, the doctrine of the New Testament, so the gospel of grace. So the New Testament begins 77% of the way through the Bible. Now, God's perfect number is seven. He made everything six days, rested on the seventh day. And that pattern of seven of completion and perfection goes throughout the entire scriptures, all the way to Revelation, where there are so many things that are seven, you can't keep track of it all. So seven is God's perfect number, and if you have not read the Bible before, you can just open it up and start reading for a little bit, and it won't take you very long to start realizing that God is, God's perfect number is seven. That number is emphasized over and over again, which is why it's just universally agreed upon with, Jew, with Jews and with Christians. God's perfect number is seven. So the number of man is six. God made man on the sixth day, the mark of the beast, 666. Uh, the number 40, testing and trials. There's so many patterns of 40 in the Bible. Then God uses the number 12, the number 8. God has specific numbers in Scripture that he uses in patterns. So today we're looking at the number 7 because that's God's number of perfection, completion, rest. So 77% of the way through the Scriptures, Jesus Christ appears. And that's if you count it by the word. So if you look at all, count all the words of the King James Bible, and you go to 77, if you look at the New Testament, Matthew 1.1, 1, 1, you'll be 77% of the way through. Now, Jesus, if you count all the genealogies, now you can find all this in Luke chapter 3. So Luke chapter 3 details the genealogy from Jesus all the way to God. So 
So all the way back, you know, to God and Adam and Seth and all the way down to Jesus. He is the 77th generation from God, where you're counting God as number one. And then you go all the way down to number 77, that's Jesus. So Jesus is the 77th. So, so Jesus shows up 77% of the ways of the scriptures as the 77th from God. And he's the seventh word of the New Testament. Matthew 1.1, 1, 1, the book of the generation of Jesus. That's word number seven of the New Testament. So if we go to the end of the Bible, Revelation 22.21, and we count the seventh word from the end, we will have Jesus as the seventh word from the end. So I'll put an arrow going this way. So Jesus is the seventh word from the end of the New Testament. He's the seventh word from the beginning of the New Testament. He's the 77th from God. And he shows up 77% of the way through the scriptures. Now, this is going to get really deep really fast. So try to stick with me here. So, all right. Where do I start? So Jesus... If you look at all the mentions of Jesus, or Jesus is, so the possessive form, so with the little apostrophe at the end of it, so you could say kind of like this, with those parentheses. So either way, if you look at those, there will be, depending on what search program you use, let me just write this down. If you, get a, if you have a search program that gives you 984 mentions of Jesus, um, here's, here's what it's doing. It's counting bar Jesus. In Acts thirteen six, that's obvious. This is a sorcerer. This is not Jesus Christ, right? If your Bible search program is giving you nine hundred eighty four total mentions of Jesus in the King James Bible, it's including Bar Jesus. Okay, so that's not right. Okay, so most search programs will give you a count of nine hundred eighty three if you're looking at all the mentions of Jesus. Uh, some search programs will give you 973, and you're like, okay, so what's the, why is one giving, okay, so which one is it? Well, 973 will give you, that's the total amount of, total count of Jesus in the singular form, so without the apostrophe. If your program is does disregarding the apostrophe, and is looking at all of those words as one word, just everything is Jesus with an apostrophe, it's going to give you 983 because there's 10 mentions of Jesus's with the apostrophe. So obviously the difference of 10. So that's the count for Jesus and it's singular. And then that's the count for Jesus and singular or possessive. Okay, now that we have that established, we have to take three more mentions away because there's three anti-mentions of Jesus in the Bible. So in Acts 7.45... I'm not sure if you can see this or not, but in Acts 7.45, it says the name Jesus, but it's talking about Joshua from the Old Testament. Jesus and Joshua are the exact same name. Jehovah is, is salvation. That's what it means. So that's talking about, in Acts 7.45, that's talking about Joshua in the Old Testament. That's not talking about Jesus Christ. Now, Joshua is a major type of Jesus Christ, like a major type of Jesus Christ. And there will be counts that, and patterns, I should say, that would actually make sense to include Joshua in the count because you're stretching back into the Old Testament. And because that's literally his name, you're looking at the name of Jehovah's salvation. But um, if you're looking at hard counts of Jesus himself, so you would exclude that one as well. So that brings the count down to 982. And then there's also a mention of Joshua in Hebrews 4.8. And... Those two mentions of Joshua, well, it says Jesus in the New Testament, but it's actually talking about Joshua, not Jesus Christ. We want to remove this from the count, so that would bring it down to 981. But then there's one more, and that's not talking about Joshua. That's talking about somebody else named Justice in Colossians 4.11. Okay, so once you exclude those um, anti-mentions, as I call them, of Jesus, you're left with a total of 980, 
There are 980 mentions of Jesus or Jesus's in the King James Bible. Okay, let me erase that so I have some space. 980 is a really big deal because of Matthew 18.22. Matthew 18.22 is when Peter asked Jesus, how many times should I forgive my brother who sins against me? And what is Jesus' response? So at Matthew 18, 22, well, let me read from verse 21. It says, Then came Peter to him and said, Lord, how oft shall my brother sin against me and I forgive him? Till seven times? So Peter is saying, till, you know, to the number of perfection, till completion. Jesus saith unto him, I say not unto thee until seven times, but until seventy times seven. So this is an equation that Jesus Christ speaks in the Bible. 70 times 7. He tells Peter, that's how many times you're to forgive your brother. 490 is, if you actually do the math, is what that equals to. So 70 times 7 equals 490. Now Jesus, he shows up 980 times. And if you're a math whiz, you'll already be catching on to that because... 980 equals 490 plus 490. Which means, let me get my eraser, which means Jesus in the Bible shows up in the New Testament. 70 times 7 plus 70 times 7 times. That's how many times the name Jesus shows up. Literally, <laughs> 70 times 7 times 2. But what's wild about this is that it's perfectly divided up into even books. Watch well, this. Let me just start with odd books, I guess. So odd books and even books. So there are 70 times 7 mentions of Jesus in odd books. So if you skip over every other book, so... Matthew, Luke, Acts, 1 Corinthians, and you keep skipping over books for the odd books. You get 70 times 7 mentions. Same thing with the even books. Now, this makes absolutely no sense when you look at it statistically because that's the, Jesus is the only heavily mentioned word in the New Testament where that happens because there are way more words in the odd books than in the even books. In the odd books, you have the book of Matthew, and you have the book of Luke, and you have the book of Revelation, those are, and those are all big books. Whereas the even books, you have Mark, and you, then you have John, and then there's really no majorly big books in the even book. But, so there's way more chapters, verses, and words in the odd books than the even books, and yet Jesus' name perfectly occurs 70 times 7 times. The equation that he spoke to Peter for the total number of times you should be forg forgiving people of sins in both books. Okay, it gets way deeper than this, don't worry. This is just the very, very beginning. So, Jesus said that he's the Alpha and the Omega, right? So, he's the seventh word of the New Testament, the seventh word from the end of the Bible. Now we go to the beginning of the Bible. The seventh word from the beginning of the Bible is heaven. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. The seventh word... In the beginning of the Bible, the seventh word in the end of the Bible is Jesus. So heaven and Jesus, when you look at those search words together, and now what we're doing now is we're stretching back into the Old Testament. We're looking at all the mentions of heaven and Jesus in the, in the King James Bible. So let me just kind of make a, a mark. So we're do, looking at all the mentions of the seventh word from the end and the seventh word from the beginning. Now, this is the type of thing where I'm talking about, like, with, with the whole Joshua thing, because he is the perfect type of Jesus. He is the name of Jesus. And we're looking at a pattern that's stretching into the Old Testament now, because we're looking at, we're looking at uh, heaven all the way back in Genesis 1, all the way to the Revelation 22. We're counting everything. So this is the kind of pattern where it actually would make sense to include the name of Jesus in the Old Testament, or the name of Jesus, I should say, 
uh, Joshua as he appears um, as Jesus in the New Testament. So we have, if you count all of them together, 1,554 mentions of heaven, the seventh word of the Bible, and Jesus, the seventh word from the end of the Bible. A total of 1,554 mentions. And when they're in the same verse, so when you have one verse and they mention both heaven and Jesus, there's a total of 49 mentions. So, but same verse. Same verse and total. What's the big deal? One thousand five hundred fifty-four equals seven hundred seventy-seven plus seven hundred seventy-seven. Forty-nine equals seven times seven. So the seventh word from the beginning and the end of the Bible shows up this many times, and this is including the mentions of Joshua Jesus. Now, I'm just gonna say up front. This is like the one of the only times I use that. I, I find the significance with that pattern because most of the time when we're dealing with patterns of Jesus, we're only looking at the New Testament. Usually I don't include the, the Joshua into the counts. The Joshua Jesus, I should say. But this time it really does make sense and it really does perfectly match. Um, okay, so we have the seventh word from the beginning and the seventh word of the, from the end. Now let's look at the first word from the beginning and the last word. So the last word of the Bible is Amen. Amen in the King James Bible when it's capitalized shows up. Let's see if we can read that. 77 times. 77 times the very last word of the Bible capitalized shows up in the Bible. The first word of the Bible, well, let me, let me just say this first. The last word of Genesis. So the last word of Revelation, amen. The last word of Genesis is Egypt. Guess how many times it shows up in the book of Genesis? 77 times. The only word in the book of Genesis to show up 77 times is the very last word of Genesis. And then in the King James Bible, the last word of the Bible, the last word of Revelation is mentioned 77 times in the Bible. Okay, let's go to the first word. The first word is in, in the beginning. If you look up all the mentions of in and amen in the book of Genesis and Revelation, you will get a total of 777 mentions. The very first word and the very last word in the first book and in the last book show up exactly 777 times. Let's keep going. Now let's keep going with these parameters of Genesis and Revelation. So in Genesis and Revelation, <laughs> I'm, I'm going to run out of space for all this. So in Genesis and Revelation, if you look up, I'm not sure how to do this. So we'll just do another one down here. If you look up in Genesis and Revelation, God, in the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. He just mentioned there in the first verse. And then the seventh word from the end, Jesus. If you look up God and Jesus in the first and the last books of the King James Bible, you'll get a total of 343 mentions, which equals 7 times 7 times 7. There are seven times seven times seven mentions of God and Jesus in the first and last books of the Bible. The Alpha and the Omega. Okay, let's keep going. The first and the last words of Genesis 1. Genesis 1, if you're not familiar with Genesis 1, details the first six days of creation. It's God creating everything in six days, and it doesn't even mention the seventh day. The seventh day is mentioned in Genesis chapter 2. Genesis 1, it just talks about six days of creation. Six literal 24-hour days. A lot of people try to say that it's uh, 
It was actually eras or big time periods. Um, no, it was 24 hour. I believe it was 24 hour days that God created everything. And the first word of Genesis 1, obviously, is in. The last word of Genesis 1 is day. How many hours are in a day? 24 hours are in a day. In and day, the first and last words of Genesis 1 are mentioned 24 times in Genesis 1, which reminds me of the 24 hours, how many hours are in a day. So in plus day equals 24 mentions in Genesis 1. But if you look in the whole Bible, the whole Bible, the first and last words of Genesis 1, you get a total of this number. So you get a total of 14,406. Now, if you look at this number, this is how many days God created the heaven and the earth. This is, this is the first and last words of Genesis 1. This is all it is. And look at the whole Bible. Six days. And this, 144, is how many hours? There are 144 hours exactly in six days. So you have literally the number of hours of creation and you have the number of days of creation in the first and last words of creation in the entire Bible. And this equals, this number equals 7 times 7 times 7 times 7 times 6. Created everything in 6 days. God created everything in 6 days. Okay, let's keep going. So, we have patterns with the first and the last words. We have patterns with the first and the last. Okay, so the first and last verses. Let's do that. So Genesis 1.1. 1, 1, um, Genesis 1.1 1, 1 has 44 letters, 27 consonants, 17 vowels. Revelation 22-21 has, so the first verse has that many letters, consonants and vowels. Revelation 22-21 has 44 letters, 27 consonants, 17 vowels. All right. There are no other verses in the entire book of Revelation that have 44 letters. So not only does it have the exact same amount of letters as Genesis 1.1, 1, 1, first and the last verses of the Bible, it has the exact same amount of consonants and vowels. And there's no other verse in Revelation that has 44 letters. There's no other verse in Jude, which is the book before Revelation, nor is there any other verse in 1st, 2nd, or 3rd John that have 44 letters. There's no verse in 1st or 2nd Peter that have 44 letters. You have to go all the way back to the book of Hebrews to find an, a verse that has 44 letters. So it just so happens in all of this mess, which is not a mess, all of this order, I should say, that we have a 44-letter verse just pop up all of a sudden with the exact same amount of vowels and consonants as Genesis 1.1. And those numbers, by the way, 17 and 27, the first time they show up in the King James Bible are literally connected to each other as the first, the beginning and the ending of the flood of Noah. The beginning, the first mention of 17 is the beginning of the flood of Noah in Genesis 7:11, And then in Genesis 8, 14, that's the first mention of 27 in the Bible. And that's the very last, the very last day when the earth is dried from the flood. So the rain starts pouring out with the first mention of 17 and the rain completely dries up, the water completely dries up on on the 27th day, the second month. So you can look at that in Genesis 7.11 and Genesis 8.14. But I won't get into much of a rabbit trail right now because there's so much else. Okay, so I was going to save this for a future video because this in itself proves that the King James Bible has superseded the Hebrew and the Greek. But I'll just get into it now because I'm just pouring everything out now that I can just so you can see how perfect this Bible is. And I want this to be the ultimate video that I refer back to in the future and say, hey, have you watched that video yet? 
So I just want this to be that video. So I'm just going to pour everything out right now. Okay, so I have very few people know about this because I've, I've told very few people because I was trying to save it for a future video, but let's, let's do this. In the last chapter of the Bible, Revelation 22. So Revelation 22, first of all, it has 21 verses, which is 7 plus 7 plus 7. It's actually the 49th chapter of the King James Bible to have 21 verses. There are exactly 49 chapters that have 21 verses. So it's the 7 times 7th chapter to have uh, 21 verses. There's, there's 7 chapters that have 49 verses. So there's 7 chapters that have 7 times 7 verses. Sorry, I'm not writing this down. If you, if you want, you can rewind it and take notes. But um, this is the 49th chapter that, have, that has 21 verses. Now, this is just completely mind-blowing. You saw how the first and the last verses are matched by the letter and the consonant and the vowel. Revelation 22, if you look at all the letters, all the consonants, and all the vowels, we're just looking at A-E-I-O-U. We're just keeping it simple because this is the pattern that we see in Revelation 22, 21, Genesis 1, 1. We're not looking at the Y rule, okay? We're looking at A-E-I-O-U. First of all, the mark of the beast, 666. In the Greek manuscripts, the Texas Receptus Greek manuscripts, it's a gematria number or an alphanumeric number. So literally, it's not like spelled out like 666. It's literally just giving you three different uh, letters which have numeric values. The Hebrew and the Greek alphabets have numeric values assigned to each letter. For example, in English, if you were to look at English, A would equal 1, B would equal 2, C would equal 3, and then all the way down to Z, which would equal, in ordinal, it would equal 26. But ordinal is only one way to do it. That's one of the ways to do it. Another way to do it is, once you get to 10, so A, B, C, D, E, F, G, so what's the 10th letter of English? It's J. So once you get to J, J equals 10, then you start skipping by 10s, all the way, so K equals 20, uh, and so forth. L equals 30, I'm trying to remember, do the alphabet in my head. M equals, okay, so anyways, if you keep going, then you get to 100, which I believe, let me check real quick on this, because I don't have this memorized on the top of my head. One second on that. A lot of these notes, by the way, are detailed in this book, Sealed by the King. Here we go. So I actually have a table here on page 528, which has a complete list, both in uh, entirely in English, Greek, and Hebrew, of their letters and their ordinal and their standard. So standard is where it starts skipping the tens, the 10, 20, 30, 40, and then it gets down to the hundreds, 100, 200, 300, 400. Okay, so... Ordinal just in the English just takes you straight to 26. So that would be over here. So ordinal takes you down to 26. So Z obviously the last letter. Standard uh, takes you down to 800 in English. Okay, anyways, I just point that all out because that's an ancient way of calculating numbers. They've been they've been doing it like that for thousands and thousands of years before the Bible was even like before the New Testament was even written. They were doing alphanumeric gematria to count letters as numbers. That's just a thing. Jesus' number in Greek is eight eight eight. That's in Greek standard. And most people know that his number is eight eight eight. So this is crazy. So Jesus Christ in Hebrew alphanumerics. So in Hebrew ordinal, Jesus Christ's number is 115. So that would literally be like uh, like Joshua, like Messiah, like Joshua HaMashiach, or whatever they would pronounce it. So Hebrew ordinal 115 is Jesus. I don't know how to write Hebrew. I don't know how to write his name Hebrew. But if you calculate his name in Hebrew, it equals 115 for Jesus Christ. And then in Greek, 
Greek ordinal, it equals 205. Okay, so Hebrew, Jesus Christ. Let me put Jesus Christ. Jesus So Jesus Christ in Hebrew ordinal was 115, in Greek ordinal is 205. And on the Hebrew standard, so Hebrew standard is where it starts skip counting like 10, 20, 30, 40, 100, 200, 300, 400. That Jesus Christ in Hebrew standard is 754. And in Greek standard is 2,368. So Jesus plus Christ equals that. So, okay, this is completely mind-blowing. Revelation 22, it has a total of 2,240 letters. If you look, break it down by the consonants and vowels, Revelation 22 is the King James Bible. You will get total vowels will be 7 times 115, and the total consonants, 7 times 205. That's the name of Jesus Christ in Hebrew, times 7. That's the name of Jesus Christ in Greek, times 7. And if you just look at the seven verses, the first seven verses of Revelation 22, the first seven verses have 754 letters. The first seven verses have Jesus Christ, Hebrew standard, total number of vowels in all of Revelation 22, the last chapter of the Bible, where he is proclaiming himself to be the first and the last. 115 times seven vowels, and then that's Hebrew ordinal, and then Greek ordinal Jesus Christ, 205, 205 times seven consonants. Are you kidding me? 2,368, the only remaining one, you couldn't even get that because there's only 2,240 letters. And 2,368 is, is greater than that, so you couldn't even get the Greek name of Jesus, or I'm assuming he would, he would have put it in like that if he, if he wanted to, but you literally have Jesus Christ's name in Hebrew and Greek three different ways perfectly in the last chapter of the Bible. By the letter, by the same system by which the first and last verses are equal to each other. How do you look at that and think that's not Jesus Christ, the Alpha and the Omega? How do you see that and think that's just random chance? Okay, let's keep going. Jesus plus Christ in the New Testament. So 980 mentions of Jesus. If you look at all mentions of Christ, all appearances of Christ, we're talking about Christ. So that's including Christians. So the name of Christ is in Christians because you're a follower of Christ. That's literally where the Christian word comes from. It's not a random word. It's because you're a, you're a Christian. You are following Christ. You're in Christ. So Jesus plus Christ, total mention in the New Testament. 777 plus 777 mentions. So 1,554 or 777 plus 777 of Jesus plus Christ. If you look at all mentions of Jesus plus Christ plus Moses. So I should write this down here. So Moses plus Jesus, for the law was given by Moses, but grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. In the verse text of the Bible, you get a total of 7 times 7 times 7 times 7 mentions of Moses plus Jesus of Christ, of appearances, I should say, of appearances. So that's Moses with or without the apostrophe, yes. Jesus, with or without the apostrophe, and all appearances of Christ. So Christ or Christ's possessive. That's not including antichrist. That's not including false Christs. It's only looking at Christ, Jesus Christ. Christ or Christ's possessive uh, or Christian or Christians. So Moses plus Jesus plus Christ. Seven times seven times seven times seven appearances. 
Okay, I forgot to mention <laughs> forgot to mention one of the, the most basic ones. In Genesis 1, the first chapter of the Bible, first chapter of the Old Testament, God directly speaks seven times seven times seven words in Genesis chapter 1. In Matthew chapter 1, the first chapter of the New Testament, God directly speaks through the angel of the Lord to Joseph. Seven times seven words, 49 words. So the first chapter of the Old Testament, God speaks directly, let there be light. He's speaking, if you count all the words that he speaks directly, personally, seven, 343 words, seven times seven times seven. First chapter of the New Testament, the angel of the Lord directly speaks, which is the word of God, seven, 49 words, seven times seven. By the way, interesting note. The seventh letter in the Hebrew alphabet is the Z in English. I just, I've always thought that's interesting, how we, the last letter for us is the seventh letter in Hebrew. It's almost like God is prophesying. Like, I mean, it, you just look at the grand view of things, the macro view. Um, I mentioned that because if you look in Genesis and Revelation, if you look at all words that start with the letter A, so I'll just put A, Plus, all words that start with the letter Z, well, there's 49 words that start with the letter Z, which is 7 times 7. But if you look at all the words that start with A or start with Z, it's a total of 7,723, 7, which is a prime number, which means it's only multiplied by 1 to get that number. You can't do uh, anything times 2 or times 3 or times 4 or anything. You can only do 7,723 times 1 because it's a prime number. If you count all the prime numbers, it's the 980th prime number. So that's the, that's how many times Jesus shows up in the Bible. 980 is how many words, starting with A or Z, first and last letters of the English alphabet, show up in Genesis or Revelation. If you look at, by the way, if you look at all words that start with A or contain the letter Z, it's 7,777. So, I don't have any more room, so I guess I'll just maybe erase some of this. I don't want to erase it, but maybe I can just put it down here. Yeah, I'll just put it down here. Um, where did I erase it? The first time that Lord, all uppercase, so L-O-R-D. All capital letters. That, that means it's talking about the name of God, not Master or Adonai, his title or position, but his name itself, Jehovah. That's how you know when you see all uppercase letters like that. That's how you know it's talking about his name. Now, I've covered this in a previous video called the 1611th Mention of Lord. You can check that out. But just as a real quick summary, the first time that you see Lord all uppercase in the New Testament, which isn't supposed to be there because... There is no Jehovah in the Greek. It only says Kyrios, which is, it should be like this. It should be like L-O-R-D, where these are all lowercase. But for whatever reason, the Holy Spirit moved the editors of the King James Bible, because it wasn't the translators. Translators in 1611 had it as L-O-R-D, lowercase, uh, overcase, lowercase O-R-D. But over uh, 1629, I believe it was, they decided... That Matthew twenty two forty four is going to have Lord with all uppercase, which is Jehovah. So the first time that shows up in the King James Bible, it's the seven hundred seventy seventh word of the chapter, Matthew twenty two. So Matthew twenty two forty four, you're going to see the first mention of Lord, and that's also the seventh time that Lord in the New Testament is quoting, is referencing. Jehovah Lord from the Old Testament. So check out the, the 16th and 11th mention of Lord. It's also, if you look at Lord plus God, so Lord all uppercase plus God all uppercase. So that's talking about uppercase G, uppercase O, uppercase D, which is also talking about the name of God. That's the 6,777th mention of Lord plus God, the first mention there in, Genesis, in, in the New Testament. Okay, 
<clears throat> now this is completely insane. This is just mind blowing. This one is one of the, the biggest ones. I mean, if this isn't enough, if it's not enough, let me do it over here. If you look at all the uppercase names of God in the Bible, and then you look at all mentions of Jesus, 980 mentions of Jesus. So we're looking at all singular names of the God in the Bible. So first of all, let's do it like this. So Lord plus God plus Jehovah. I can verify all of this again. This is all verifiable. I can send you any screenshot, any search. I can send you the search files themselves so you can just load it onto your computer and see for yourself on the program King James Pure Bible Search, which is by far the most accurate program. I am plus Ja. So these are all the like uppercase letter, uppercase names. So every single letter is uppercase. That's all. That's that's all of them in the Bible. So if you calculate all of those, there are a total of nine hundred seventy times seven mentions. Jesus, remember, 980, and 10 of those are possessive mentions, right? With the apostrophe, which means singular mentions of Jesus, there's 970 in the, in the King James Bible. So if you look at all uppercase names of Jehovah, of the Lord, you get 970, which is literally Jesus, how many times he shows up? Times seven. Oh, I just I just remember another one real quick. First and the last chapters of, of the Old Testament, Genesis one and Malachi four, give you a total of nine hundred eighty words, which is nine times Jesus shows up. So literally, the number of words in the first and last chapters of the Old Testament. Okay, sorry. Back to this one. So now let's just look at it like this. Now let's add in all the mentions of Jesus. So. So let's say we're going to add Jesus and then all of his uppercase mentions as well. So there's king and then there is also branch. Let me just emphasize, there are no other na uppercase names of God in the Bible and there are no other uppercase names of Jesus in the Bible. It's the king of kings and the lord of lords. Uh, he's the king of the Jews. He's the branch, and that's in the Old Testament. That's talking about Jesus. There are no other, in the entire Bible, there's no other uppercase names of God or Jesus. When you add them all together, and this is with the 980 count, you get 7,777. How does that happen amidst all this? Tell me, how does that happen? How does any of this all happen in one book? How does like four or five of these things happen in one book? Let's see if I have any more space. If you look at the entire Bible, 1 John 5, 7 says, For there are three that bear a record in heaven, the Father, the Word and the Holy Ghost, and these three are one. That verse is the most attacked verse in the King James Bible. That verse is a forgery. It's not a real verse. That's not actually scripture. John didn't write those words. That's the scholarly position. Well, I'll show you God's position. You look at the Father. And this is looking at the entire Bible. Look up the Word and Holy Ghost. You get a total 777 mentions. I just forgot one. I just remembered one that's super important. This does not deserve to be down here. 
This is literally like my favorite pattern in the entire Bible. So I'm ashamed that I forgot about it until now. So if you look at the entire Bible of all capitalized mentions of Father and Son, when they're talking about God and Jesus, this is not talking about... So there's, a, for example, in Luke 16 with the rich men in hell, he, he says, Father Abraham. And that's the beginning of a sentence. So the capital, the, the, the Father is capitalized, capital F. So we're excluding everything like that. We're excluding all the mentions of Son. For example, in Ezekiel, God says, Son of Man, talking to Ezekiel over and over and over again. We're getting rid of all the mentions that are not Father, that are, sorry, that are not God and not Jesus. We're only looking at God and Jesus. There are 70, do I have enough room? There are 70, there are 490 mentions in the entire Bible. It's 70 times 7. But the crazy thing is when you start breaking it down in the New Testament. Because when you look at the Gospels of Father and Son, there are 7 times 7 times 7 mentions. And then when you look at the first 7 epistles, there are 7 times 7 mentions of Father and Son. And you look at the last 14 epistles, there's 77 mentions of Father and Son. And then if you look at Revelation, there's seven mentions of Father and Son. And when you look at the first 12 books, there's seven times seven times seven verses of Father and Son, verses that mention Father and Son. And there's 70 verses in the Pauline epistle that mention Father and Son. And of course, Revelation, seven verses that mention Father and Son. So we have... Father and Son, 70 times 7 mentions in the whole Bible, and then we have all these other intricate ways as well that you can look at it where it's just broken up perfectly. Now, okay, first of all, I totally forgot to keep going with the Godhead patterns. If you look at God, Jesus, and Holy Spirit in the New Testament, you get a total of 777 times 3 mentions. If you look at the total of God plus Jesus plus his spirit in the entire Bible, you get 777 times 7 mentions. So if you do, do this but his spirit instead of Holy Spirit, you get 777 times 7 mentions. <laughs> How do I get into all this? In the Gospels, let me just stick in the Gospels for a second. If you look at all mentions in the Gospels of God plus Father, so, and that's only talking about God the Father, there are 491 mentions. However, there is one time when they're conjoined to say God the Father, and that's in John chapter 6. Uh, for him have God the Father sealed. So there's one con conjoined mention, which means if you look at all the mentions together, there's 490, there's 70 times 7 in the Gospels. If you look at, at God, so I have no room to write all this. I'm just kind of saying it now. But um, in the New Testament, if you look at all mentions of God in the historic, I mean, yeah, in the historical books. So that's the Gospels and then Acts, because that's like basically the, the historical or narrative part of the New Testament. And the rest of the New Testament, it's either epistles or then the apocalypse, Revelation, which is just doctrinal, which is letters being written to churches. But actual events in history, recorded events, historical narratives, the Gospel and Acts. And if you look at the Gospels and Acts, God, capital G, whether it's an apostrophe yes or not, shows up 70 times, 7 times. So God, um, I'll put like that 70 times, 7 times in historical books of the New Testament. So New Testament, historical. And then if you look at the epistles, there's 21 epistles, 7 plus 7 plus 7. God same thing shows up 777 times, and then you're only left with Revelation. Revelation, God shows up 99 times 
In the last chapter, in Revelation 22, God shows up seven times. And he's also the 77th letter of Revelation 22 is God. And the 490th letter of Revelation 22, which we already covered the letters of Revelation 22, but even more, <laughs> forgot to mention these. The 490th letter of Revelation 22 is Lord, the first letter of Lord. So literally God and Lord, in Revelation 22, and the 77th letter and the 490th letter. Is there anybody who's going to stand up and say, without a shadow of a doubt, that is just a coincidence? Can anybody rationally mind it? Look at this and say, just a lucky accident. And again, like I said in the beginning, forget the fact that this is the most influential and printed book in the history of mankind. If you found this in any book, would you not be taken aback and say, that is something that comes from a mind. When you're reading, you're literally interacting with the book that the Holy Ghost is working through and has inspired. And he's speaking directly to your soul when you're reading from this Bible. Now, obviously, in other languages, let me, let me get this straight. Because I know so many people will start accusing. They'll say, well, what about people in other languages? And what about people, like, can you not get saved unless you have a King James Bible? Where was the perfect Bible before 1611? Those are all ridiculous questions. They're so easily answered, and you can apply the same questions to Jesus Christ, and you will give the same answers as you would with the King James Bible. Where was Jesus Christ before, before 4 BC or 0 AD, you know, whenever he showed up? Where was Jesus Christ? Well, he was there. It was, it was just, he wasn't revealed yet. It wasn't the right timing yet. Same thing with the King James Bible. Right after the printing press gets invented, and right after England, right before England spreads out to the entire earth where the Bible could get pushed out into all the world, it's the final end time language. Okay, the Bible in English was pretty much given at the, the perfect time. So, there, all the objections. Can you get saved from any version? Of course you can get saved. The, the gospel is to believe on Jesus Christ. He died for your sins. He rose again on the third day. To be born again, to be born of the Spirit, when you believe on Jesus Christ, He saves you. When you call to Him as a sinner, when you admit, you come to Him and say, I am a sinner, I have come short of the glory of God, and you humble yourself before Him and you fall to His feet, you ask for forgiveness, you ask for salvation, He saves you. All the objections that you have against the King James Bible, there's so many answers to, but you're just so close-minded. And you're so guided and grounded on the philosophy of men, which is that only the originals are inspired and only the originals could be perfect. But you serve God, the living God. He's omniscient, omnipotent. He knew the end from the beginning and he's proven it to you. Humble yourself before God. And ask him, is this you doing this? Or is this just a lottery? Or is it Satan? Did Satan make Jesus Christ appear perfectly with his perfect amount of mentions and, and all these other patterns? And just did, did Satan do that? No, obviously not. Is it an accident? I think any logically, rationally mind will say, no, obviously not. The burden of proof is so overwhelming. And again, I didn't even get into anything, <clears throat> everything. Once you start getting into, I mean, all the notes, I apologize for the ones I missed. It just becomes so abundantly clear. This is the book of the Lord. The book that God has signed and sealed with his own name. I just don't understand why people don't see it. There's no emotion happening here. I mean, I'm excited a little bit, but forget about me. Take me out of the picture. I'll step over here. What is all this? 
The mind of a man? The product of random chance? Or is this of the mind of God? With his number of perfection that he himself has set in the text of the Bible. No matter how hard you try, you cannot find a verse that says only the originals are inspired. No matter how hard you try, that's not scripture. That's not absolute truth. What is absolute truth? Seek ye out of the book of the Lord and read. That book of the Lord is absolute truth. The book of the Lord exists in the end times. Isaiah. 34, 16. You can't get rid of that verse. That whole chapter is end time prophecy. I've done a Bible study on it in context if you would like to see it on this channel. You can't get, you can't get rid of that verse. That verse is absolute truth. And it's being perfectly demonstrated to us in a way that we could, no man could have possibly done. But your verse, for only the originals are inspired, is in the book of Second Opinions. Because there is no Bible verse for it. Jesus Christ, when he's going against Satan, in Matthew 4 and Luke 4, all he does is quote the scriptures. It is written, it is written, it is written. I could call 12 legions of angels and set up my kingdom here on earth. I'm just paraphrasing. But how would the scriptures be fulfilled? The scriptures cannot be broken. He emphasized the jot and the tittle. He's the Alpha and the Omega. Jesus Christ is who I put my trust in. And I put my trust in the book that tells me who Jesus Christ is. I believe that book is perfect. And I believe the book proves itself. Now unto the King Eternal, Immortal, Invisible, the only wise God, be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. Is anything too hard for the Lord?